best thing. Put this out of the way. Okay, I see what you're doing there. Um, I don't know. Okay, I see what you're doing there. Alright, introduce it. So tonight we have Jared studying the Khan Academy, <laughs> which, you know, Star Trek. I've been working on the US history content here for more than two years now, and we have a team of experts who've been in the classroom for many years, who have advanced degrees in US history, who really rigorously write, tape, and edit each other's work. I think it would be kind of, I would judge that as like a day's work in class. Everything that we've done on the Khan Academy website meets the AP requirements. So teachers can feel confident that when they send their students to watch a video or read an article or practice with an exercise on Khan Academy, the students are taking away the key learning objectives that they should get for the AP exam. It's a frequent misconception that people in this time period thought that the world was flat. We really wanted to make this material approachable and fun. And so throughout, I think students will see a real enthusiasm for the material and a sense of humor so that it's not just reading a history textbook. So I brought you here to talk about the Gilded Age, which is one of my favorite eras of American history. Because everything was great and covered in gold. It's really interacting with some of the big questions of history and having an opportunity to explore those with enthusiasm. No, because it's the only era of American history I can think of that has a sarcastic name. <laughs> because it is fun. We hope to give students that sense that history is not a boring subject. It's really fun. Okay. I think one of the most underrated skills for learning history is learning how to think like a historian. And what do I mean by thinking like a historian? Does that mean that you have to go out and buy a tweed jacket with some elbow patches and maybe grow a long white beard and sit around all day pondering whether the Civil War was caused by slavery or states' rights? No, but you can try that if you want. But I would say thinking like a historian is a little bit like being a combination between a storyteller <coughs> and a scientist. I'm guessing you draw a really, really bad beaker here. There we go. Get some little fumes coming off of that. And a lawyer. Maybe I'll put a, a gavel here. It's a gavel, not a croquet mallet or a hammer. So first, let's start with the storytelling aspect. I think one of the most important things that we can learn from telling the story of history is that in a good story, nothing just happens, right? Um, right. Uh, imagine a story where everything just happened. The story would be the wind blows, the earth turns, right? No one is making those things happen, and that's why it's kind of a boring story because it doesn't show cause and effect. And that cause and effect is really the backbone of history, right? And you would be surprised how often people can fall into the trap of telling history, this incredible story about what people have done in the past that has led to the society we have today, as if it were kind of a laundry list of events that just followed one after another without any possibility of things being different. People will say, and then World War II happened, or, and then the United States was born, right? Those statements are in passive voice because they don't talk about the people who make these things happen. And really, short of a natural disaster, pretty much everything happens in history because people made it happen. So when you think like a historian, you kind of think the same way that a novelist might think, okay, what is this character's motive? What are they going to do to make their wish come true? What are the influences that lead a person to make certain choices? And just like people make choices, nations make choices, right? World War I didn't just happen. And just as people make choices, actions have consequences. You wouldn't write a story where a thief stole $100 million and the police didn't even try to come after her. Neither can you write a story about history without talking about the effects that actions have on people. So that's the storytelling aspect of thinking like a historian. Let's talk about the scientific aspect. We often think of history as something that's, that's pretty much done, right? Uh, it's a series of events that happened in the past, and now we just have to memorize what happened so we can learn from it and maybe have a good idea about what to do in the future. But really, there's only so much we can actually know about what happened in the past. And so historians always have to do a kind of research to understand what happened and get a better idea of what people were feeling. So just like scientists have theories, when historians think about the past, they're really thinking about theories as well. They're saying, okay, I have a theory about what caused the evolution of jazz in the 1920s. Why did jazz become a major popular form of music in the 1920s? Well, I'm going to theorize it was because people were reacting to the horror of World War I, which made so many people interested in kind of staccato notes and discordant sounds. All right, so that's a theory. Well, how do you go about proving a theory? And the answer is you do research and you consult evidence, right? And the way that you do that in history is usually by doing a lot of reading, right? You might say, all right, well, let me take the letters of some jazz musicians from this time period and see what they write about. Maybe they write all about how they experienced a battle in World War I and they were trying to reflect that in their music. Or maybe they write that World War I had nothing to do with their interest in music. Actually, they wanted to simulate the sounds of flight because they were so interested in modern forms of transportation. So our understanding of what happened in the past is always just a theory. I mean, we have a pretty good idea of what was going on most of the time, but new information comes to light all the time, right? I mean, people are always cleaning out their grandma's attic and finding some new documents. And as the preponderance of the evidence shifts and changes, so might our understanding of the past. The last aspect of thinking like a historian I want to talk about is this kind of lawyerly aspect. And what I mean by this is that historians are always making an argument. 
just like a lawyer gets up in a courtroom and says, here's my idea. Now let me support it with the evidence from witnesses, from experts, from objects that we might have found at a crime scene. A historian is saying, believe my theory believe my evidence. And I think the analogy of law is really powerful here because you can see the same pieces of evidence used to support two different arguments. So for example, say there's maybe a sock that was found at the scene of a crime, right? Here's our sock. <laughs> Not a beautiful artist. But maybe the prosecution tries to argue that the accused must have committed this crime because the sock is his size. Yeah, exactly. Right, the sock shows he did it. Whereas the defense might say, my client never wears socks, he always wears sandals. So it's clear that the sock shows that he couldn't possibly have been the one to do this crime. So that's how we end up with so many different interpretations of the same event. The task of the historian is to gather evidence and to present an argument that they think will best convince the public of their interpretation. And so these interpretations do change over time. So in later videos, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of how you tell these stories and make these arguments. But for now, I just kind of want you to see that thinking like a historian is not something that only historians can do. It's actually a really useful skill for lots of aspects of your life. We tell stories, search for evidence, and make arguments in our lives all the time about things that we interact with every day, like our favorite bands, our favorite favorite foods, our political views, right? We base those on our own experiences, consequences in our lives, and evidence that we see around us. And we can do the same thing for the past. It's not such a foreign country. What we have are the remnants <laughs> of that past and the ability to interpret them. Hello, David. Hello, Kim. So today, what we're doing is taking a look at this speech by one of my favorite presidents, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, which he gave at his inauguration in 1933. And I think what's really important about looking at a speech like this is not only that we can learn to analyze this as a primary source, which will be helpful for thinking about it historically, but also because I think it's really useful to be able to look at a presidential speech or a speech given by any politician and understand what kind of claims they're making and how they're making them. So, Kim, before we go any further, what, what even is a primary source? What's the difference between a primary and a secondary source? Great question. So a primary source is a document that takes a look at an event from the perspective of someone who was there. So a primary source could be lots of things. Uh, it could be a photograph taken by someone who was perhaps attending a political rally. It could be a diary of maybe someone who was active in the women's rights movement in the 19th century. Certainly any uh, speech or even, let's say, like a, an oral history conversation. And, and I've mentioned a lot of significant things here, but it also doesn't even have to be something that is connected with a significant person or a famous event. It could be uh, a shopping list, right? Uh, if you are studying the consumption habits of someone who lives in the 1950s, what they bought at the grocery store would tell you a lot about what they ate, what they could spend. Uh, so a primary source is kind of the, the real meat of research material that shows you what people at the time were thinking. Okay, so a primary source is an artifact left behind by someone who was there. Exactly. What is a secondary source? So a secondary source is an interpretation. So say I'm a historian, which I happen to be. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Like, who is it? Uh, so I have done the work of digging up a bunch of primary sources, and then you look at all of them and see what they have in common, for example. So maybe I'm writing about Abraham Lincoln, and I get a lot of photographs of Lincoln, I get a lot of writings by Lincoln and his contemporaries, and I go through <laughs> all of them, and I come up with my interpretation of what was going on in Lincoln's life. So I write a book on Lincoln by Kim. Um, Until now. <laughs> and... Um, that's my interpretation, okay. right? So the things that I'm interested in, say Lincoln's religion or lack thereof, might not be the same things that another historian would be interested in. Say they're interested in Lincoln's foreign policy. So my interpretation is just one way of looking at those primary sources where another historian might have a completely different interpretation. What's also important about secondary sources is that I wasn't there, right? I never talked to Lincoln. He you know, died more than 100 years before I was born, which means that you can only trust me so much. You can instead maybe get a much clearer picture of what Lincoln was really thinking by reading his own words. So trust secondary sources about as far as you can throw them. Well, maybe trust all sources about as far as you can throw them, right? Because everyone at every time has their own perspective. And so the ideas of someone who lived in the 19th century are going to be different than the ideas of someone who lives now. And you only know as much as you can know, right? You're only as informed as the information that you have. So you really have to take everything with a grain of salt and compare it with other sources from its time period and other sources later on to get a sense of what's important. So you're saying that you might have a different perspective on Lincoln than another Lincoln scholar, but that Lincoln's writings themselves also contain Lincoln's own biases from his lifetime. Right. Okay. So what are we doing with Rosa Roosevelt's inaugural address here. All right, so let's take a look at this inaugural address as though we're historians, right? We're going to sit down and really get into the... The feeling of the Great Depression? <laughs> All right. We're going to get depressed. All right, I'm ready. So we determined that because he was there and because this is a speech delivered by him, that the speech of Franklin Delano Roosevelt is a primary source. Right, and it's a great way to look at the Great Depression, right? If we want to know what people are thinking about, it's very important to see what the President of the United States has to say when he's been elected. So David, I know that you've been dying to read this in your terrific impression of Roosevelt, so I'm going to turn it over to you to get a sense of what Roosevelt has to say. Okay, I'm going to scoot back to the mic. I am certain that my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impel. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive, and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so how do we analyze this as a primary source and as a speech? I think the first thing we want to do, step one, if you will, is just identify what's going on. And thankfully, that's pretty easy for us right now. Right, right? this is a speech given by the President of the United States in the moment that he becomes President. Right, so we know when it was in March 4th, 1933. Uh, we know who gave this speech. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, just about to be inducted as president. Uh, we know why he gave it, right? Very important mm -hmm. for presidents when they take office to make an inaugural address. So we've got some basics here. Uh, we can even infer from the inaugural address where this was given, right? In Washington, D.C. 
All right, so in our identification, we've got that it's a speech, it was in BC, happened in 1933, by FDR. So that's our identification stage. So to get at a little deeper level for this, let's let's move on to a second step, which would be kind of giving some context. So it's 1933, what's going on? Um, let's see. So um, the Great Depression has been going on for four years. Mm -hmm. um, prohibition has not ended yet, right? right? Repeal has not come. So liquor is still illegal in the United States for um, for sale and transport. There's massive unemployment. The Dust Bowl is still raging. America is not in the greatest place. No, it, it's a depression, and it's a depression in all sorts of ways, right? Uh, people are emotionally depressed, and there's an economic depression. All right, so we've got the general gist now that this is a speech from 1933 confronting the Great Depression. So let's get into a little bit more of the specifics. What is he actually talking about in this speech? Well, if, if we look at the speech, you can kind of see that he's acknowledging that things are bad, right? right? Uh, it's time to speak the truth. So he keeps talking about how, you know, it's time to speak the truth. We'll address the American people with candor. It is time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly, and boldly. Uh, we will not shrink from honestly facing conditions in the country today. Um, so Roosevelt is really priming everyone to say, like, okay, you have not been told the truth from your head of government for the longest time, and now it's time to deal, frankly, with just how bad things have gotten. And what's interesting is that he says uh, things are not, you know, great, but uh, in, every, in every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. And he's saying that there's no need to be afraid of anything except just malaise. He's saying that Americans need to meet the problem of the depression with like an upwelling of national will. Right, and I think, you know, it's nice that he's saying, look, I'm going to tell hey, you uh, things are bad. I recognize that things are bad. And that's very important mm -hmm. because up until this hey, point, Herbert Hoover hasn't really done much to recognize that things were bad. You know, he saw that people were suffering, and yet he said this is not necessarily the responsibility of government to deal with this crisis. So Roosevelt actually calls it a dark hour of our national life, right? Like this is a, acknowledging that things are not great is a big part of the speech, but he's also saying that it's possible for us to bounce back if we are honest about the problems and we address it with vigor. And that is kind of the New Deal, right? Is addressing the problems honestly and with national exuberance. Yeah, and I think this is such a fascinating speech because, for one thing, this phrase has kind of come into our, our national lexicon, right? There's nothing to fear but fear itself, which is kind of strange. It's one of those things like have your cake and eat it too. That mm -hmm. you're like, wait, how is that possible? So, what does he mean by the only thing we have to fear is fear itself? I think he's saying that this is no time to panic and that the only thing that we should be afraid of is unreasoning terror. We shouldn't be running around like chickens with our heads cut off, right? Like, this is the time to stand firm against nameless terror and focus on making the problems that we are facing into small, like, accessible, combatable chunks. I think another thing that's important about what he's saying there is that the Great Depression is caused by something that is very new in American culture, which is the stock market. And the stock market doesn't play by the rules of straight supply and demand. Instead, they play on confidence. And so the reason that the stock market crash of 1929 happens is because people stop having confidence that stocks are worth as much as the stock market says they are. Mm -hmm. So everyone pulls out, there's a panic, and global banking pretty much collapses. And that's a really hard thing to deal with, right? I mean, it's not like you're taking your money out of the bank or me taking my money out of the bank at any one time could cause an international depression. Right. But when there is a large group of people who all get panicked at the same time and take their money out of the banks, the banks fail. Right. And so I think what Roosevelt is saying is that we cannot allow a sweeping wave of panic to come over the nation again. Exactly. So that's the context for this speech is things are bad. The reason things are bad is because of this wave of nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. And America, I need your support to make sure that we don't let that happen again so that we can turn this retreat into an advance. In our next video, we'll go more into how we can analyze this source and use it to construct an argument of our own. So in our last video, we started looking at this speech by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which he gave at his inauguration in March of 1933. And we took some time to just identify what was happening in this speech and also the context of this speech coming at the height of the Great Depression. So now we're going to dive deeper into our textual analysis and explore the source, figure out what is going on with Roosevelt's language and what he's trying to say and what his biases are. So let's get a little more into what else goes on in this speech, not just the very famous opening paragraph. So we start here with saying uh, people are facing the grim problem of existence and a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. Um, and then what comes next? Well, so let's, let's hear all this in context. So um, yet our distress comes from no failure of substance. We are stricken by no plague of Focused. Compared with the perils which our forefathers conquered, because they believed and were not afraid, we still have much to be thankful for. Nature still offers her bounty, and human efforts have multiplied it. Plenty is at our doorstep, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind good have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure and abdicated. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. Restoration calls, however, not for changes in ethics alone. This nation asks for action and action now. What's interesting about this paragraph is that there's a lot of Bible stuff going on in here. Um, there's a lot of biblical references uh, that serve to do, I think, a lot of work uh, for Roosevelt uh, in this inaugural address. As you talked, I just underlined the things that really stood out to me as maybe kind of the heart of what he was saying. And you're saying these are like biblical references. So what do you mean by that? Some, some of them are. So when we're talking about plague of locusts and money changers specifically, um, we're looking at Old and New Testament references respectively. In fact, later in the speech, he refers to money changers being chased out of our nation's temple, which is a deliberate reference to the New Testament. Okay, so this is this is very grand. We love to hear this speech so much because mm -hmm. it has that kind of ringing of authenticity in, in a way that maybe a modern speech does not. Well, some of that authenticity comes through association with epic literature and the Bible. So he's making these allusions to great biblical events, right? Like the plague of locusts being visited upon Egypt, which was like a great and terrible plague, and he's using that as a counterpoint to the misery of the present moment. He's saying, look, things could be worse, we could be ancient Egypt in the Bible, and locusts could be eating all of our crops. Things are bad, but it's not like God himself is willing destruction upon us. Okay, yeah, I, I think this is also another kind of really interesting thing about the Great Depression. I mean, it's true that there were farm failures during the Dust Bowl, mm -hmm. but on the whole, it's not like people stopped producing food. This wasn't a famine. What it was was a crisis of confidence, where prices went down significantly, and so farmers could not make a living on their crops. It's not that they didn't have food, it's that they didn't have money. Right. I also feel like there's a different aspect to the reason that he uses this biblical language here, and I think that's because it's very authoritative, right? When you stand up in front of a group of people and you know, Roosevelt has this powerful voice which really resonates with people and you speak like a preacher would speak it says that this is a man of authority this is a man who perhaps is in touch with the moral authority associated with the Christian Bible sure and I mean for the for a very long time authority was kind of correlated with your ability to quote chapter and verse I and mean, we're talking about a man who just put his hand on a Bible in order to swear himself in 
So it really makes him seem not only like he knows what he's talking about, but also that he's got a handle on the situation. So, so what we're saying is that by, by harnessing this language, he's trying to harness the authority that people have invested in the church by using the language of the church. So what we're doing here I might call step three, which is to identify how an argument is made, right? Uh, so we're looking at his rhetorical strategies uh, and seeing how they're effective or, in perhaps another case, not effective in conveying his opinion. And I say opinion. At this point, what would we say that his opinion of the Great Depression is? That it's specific people's fault, uh, that it is at the fault of not just this wave of panic, but um, on account of some greedy people, the unscrupulous money changers and the rulers of the exchanges. So he's blaming bankers for the Great Depression, which I think is, is fair. I mean, there's very little regulation in the 1920s that would prevent the kind of fraud that could lead to a collapse of banking. For example, uh, insider trading is not illegal. Or, and most people bought stocks on margin, which is a terrible idea, which means you only have to put 10% of the value of a bond down before you buy it, which means that there's a lot of theoretical money floating around out there that's not backed by much real money. Oh, that sounds like a terrible idea. It was a terrible so it's idea. Like buying, it's like, like buying stocks on credit? Exactly. Oh, man. His argument is that, first, things could be worse. Second of all, the reason things are bad is because of these people. Thing number three, here's how we're going to get back on track. All right, so this is where we get here at the end. So the nation asks for action, and action now, which I'd say is, uh, you know, not only a mention of how he's going to get things done, but a covert poke at Herbert Hoover for not doing much. <laughs> and then he says, our greatest primary task is to put people to work. Remember, there's an unemployment rate of 25%. And so many people. Our current unemployment rate is less than 5%, to right. give you an idea. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously. It can be accomplished in part by direct recruiting by the government itself, trading the task as they retreat the emergency of a war, but at the same time, through this employment, accomplishing greatly needed projects to stimulate and reorganize the use of our natural resources. This is a radical idea. It is a really radical idea. And this is one reason why historians love to study the Great Depression and the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, because this is kind of the decade where we threw out the rule book. And I think what Roosevelt is saying here is that he was willing to try anything to conquer the Great Depression. And one of the things he tries is bringing the government into the process of giving people work. Okay, so we've got a sense of what he's arguing and how he's arguing it. But let's take a, a higher level look now. So let's say step four is seeing if you can analyze the potential bias of a source. And I want to be clear that all sources are biased. I think uh, a common misconception is that if you're looking at a source, it's either biased or it's not, right? It's written by someone who has an agenda or someone who's completely impartial. And that is never the case. What about a photograph? If I take a photograph of something or someone, isn't that an objective rendering of that person or object? Well, it certainly shows what was there at that moment in time. But even photographers are making choices, right? When you pick up a camera and you take a picture of a thing, you are taking a picture of that thing and not something else, which is in itself a form of bias to say, I think this is important or this is what I want you to see. So where we put the frame is a choice. Yes. So, so the question is, what is Roosevelt not saying in this speech? What is he not taking a photograph of? What's just outside the view of his camera? And why is he taking this photograph of a speech, right? When he sat down to write this, what was motivating him? And what are some of the perhaps even less obvious factors about why he makes the argument that he does? Well, I mean, obviously the man has a bias in favor of his own politics. I mean, these are his administration's ideas, right? So he's going to be coming out in favor of, of those very strongly. So FDR is a Democrat. Um, and there really haven't been many Democrats in office since before the Lincoln administration, which sure. is the 1860s. So that's a new thing. I mean, this is the, the popular base rejecting Hoover and the Republican Party because of the Great Depression. Right. So he's bringing Democratic political ideas to the table here. So he's trying to make a case for those political ideals in this speech. He was elected by a majority of American voters, but now he has to make the case to the rest of the United States. He has to make the case to the people that didn't elect him. Right. And so he's saying that direct recruiting by the government itself, government jobs, having the powers as if the Depression were war, that is a case for really strong government intervention, mm -hmm. which is a keystone of the Democratic Party compared to Republicans who generally advocate for a smaller government. So he's saying this is what's going to work. The Democratic platform of using the government in the economy and in social programs is what's going to work to get us out of this depression. So he's making like a big, strong case for federalism. Exactly. What I think is interesting, though, here is that there's a lot he doesn't say. And mm -hmm. I think that's also important to look at when you're analyzing primary source. There's a lot that you could talk about, but you make choices about what to talk about and what not to mention. So what would you say he doesn't mention here? He doesn't mention how any of this is going to work. Yeah, I think that's maybe the biggest missing piece here, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is this is broad strokes. This is getting people on board, but nowhere does he say, okay, here's exactly what I'm going to do. Let me tell you how many dollars I'm going to spend, how many people I'm going to hire, what sort of cabinets I'm going to create. This is not a time for specifics, sure. he says. This is almost more of an inspirational speech to say, okay, I gotcha. All right, so we've looked at the source, we've kind of analyzed its rhetorical strategy and its potential bias. So the last thing we might want to do with this is now think about how we could use it as a source. Okay. So, so we're taking this primary source and we're turning it into a secondary source. Right. So say that you are sitting down to write an essay mm -hmm. about the Great Depression um, and you've got to say, all right, now how can I use Franklin Delano Roosevelt's inaugural address to make my point in my essay? So let's say step five, um, let's say synthesize perhaps, not a big word, nice. as a tool for your own argument. So I would say that this speech is the frame that Roosevelt is putting on the Depression. This is how he is creating the narrative that he wants Americans to adopt. Yeah, He's identifying the crisis, and this is how he wants people to see it. Yeah, so this might be a great primary source to tell you about Roosevelt's strategy or his communication strategy. What might it not be a very good primary source to help you make an argument for? Um, it probably wouldn't be a very good primary source for um, the Republican legislative response. Mm -hmm. You know, you might want to go with uh, Senator Reed Smoot of Utah or something like that. Right, um, and it's probably not a great source for really diving into the specifics of the New Deal, right? I mean, he doesn't say anything about the Civilian Conservation Corps. He doesn't say anything about the National Recovery Administration. This is not the, the nuts and bolts of the New Deal. It's the grand idea behind it. Right, he's trying to sell the New Deal. Right, so it's, it's I think, a, a really powerful primary source for understanding the impetus behind the New Deal, but not the programs. Sweet. All right, well, thank you for bringing your sweet grammarian skills to the table as we look at Roosevelt's speech. My pleasure. Thank you for bringing your sweet historian skills to the table. Tim and David out. Scholarly high five. 
I want to talk about how to avoid some common mistakes when you're writing a historical paper. Now, this could apply to a term paper, to a blue book essay, even really to your master's thesis if you wanted to. I want to talk about three phrases that you might be tempted to use in a historical essay that actually muddy what you're trying to say and undercut your point more than it helps. So these three phrases that I want to talk about are throughout history. It was inevitable. And, and that's why, uh, insert country here, uh, is so great today. So why are these phrases so problematic? Let's start with throughout history. So this is something that you frequently see in writing, uh, from historical essays to pieces of journalism, and it often has the ring of making something seem really strong and adding the weight of eons of history behind a single sentence. History is a very long thing. I mean, for recorded history, we're going back maybe 5,000, 7,000 years. And think about the many different cultures and types of people and ideas that existed throughout that time period. If you're sitting down to write an essay about, say, the Cold War, and you start, throughout history, people have feared nuclear attack. Well, the first thing your reader is going to think is, wait, the nuclear bomb was only developed in 1945. I mean, that's not throughout history. That's only throughout the last 70 years. Or what about, throughout history, people have gone to war over religion. Your reader might think, well, what about when people didn't live close enough to each other to go to war about different beliefs? And do we really want to send the message that having different religions means that you necessarily have to go to war? One thing that throughout history does is it makes an assumption about human nature, right? Um, that the way that people think now is the way that people have always thought throughout history. Or the way that people behave now is the way that people have always behaved throughout history. And if there's anything that is one of the core beliefs of the study of history, it's that people are different over time. It's fun to study the past because people in the past weren't like us. They had different ideas, different beliefs, different cultural values. And so if you want to be really strong about how you start a historical essay, always start it in a really specific part of time that you're talking about. So if you're talking about the period from 1945 to 1965, say, in the post-war era, or in the late 19th century, and you might also add, in the United States, right? This shows that you have a strong grasp of both the time and the place that you're writing about. And so you can make an argument that is specific to that time period. Okay, let's move on to it was inevitable. I think we like to use the word inevitable because it's long and it sounds pretty cool. Uh, but think about what inevitable really means. It means it was unavoidable. There was no other thing that could have happened. Now think of a version of history where everything is inevitable. Everything was just going to happen no matter whether anyone did anything or not. That shows an interpretation of history that says that people's choices don't matter. And if you want to emphasize anything in history, it's how much choices matter. There are very few things that are inevitable in history. Most of them, I would say, are natural disasters, right? That there's going to eventually be an earthquake in California is inevitable because there's a fault line. That's something that humans can't control. But for almost everything else in history, humans can control it. And they do decide how to react to certain situations. For example, take the sinking of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor, right? This is the event that leads to the United States going to war with Spain over Cuba in 1898. And the reason that this happened was because the USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor. Now, we know, and the Spanish suggested at the time, that the reason that the USS Maine exploded was due to a spontaneous combustion on board. There was an equipment malfunction. The United States chose to believe that the ship sinking was the result of a Spanish bomb and declared war. Now, you might have said war was inevitable, but it really wasn't. There were many ways that the United States could have chosen differently in that moment to say, uh, well, maybe we will believe the Spanish and just leave it alone. Or maybe we'll send some financial aid to Cuba, but we don't have to go to war. When you get rid of inevitability in history, you open up new choices, new ways that things could have gone. And that is really the heart of history, is the possibility for things to be different than they were, different than they are. Okay, let's finish up with, and that's why Intercountry Here is so great today. You see this all the time in historical papers, and I think writers are very tempted to finish a historical essay with some expression of patriotism. And maybe in a few rare cases this is true. You could say, the United States is a better place today than it was in the 1950s thanks to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But it's something you want to use very sparingly, because usually the scope of a historical paper, and think about our, our throughout history here, isn't so huge as to merit the reaction to it being, this is the heart of what makes America great today. I've read historical papers about the Spanish flu in 1919 that end with, and that's why America is great today. Ask yourself, is this relevant? And even if it is, is it the most relevant way that you could end an essay? For a historical essay, you want to keep your conclusions very specific, the same way that you want to keep your period of time specific. So if you're talking about the post-war era, conclude with something that you can actually substantiate, that you have substantiated in your essay about the post-war era. You say, the wealth generated by industrialization after World War II was the reason that the baby boom happened. Don't say, and that's why America is great today. What do you mean by great? Do you mean economically great, culturally great, politically great? It's a little too vague, and vagueness can really undermine your argument as opposed to supporting it. In a way, these are all kind of appeals for human nature, appeals for the natural progress of history, uh, and appeals to patriotism that are less rooted in the facts of what you want to say than they are rooted in ways of trying to get your reader sympathy. Instead, what you can do is be specific in your time and your place, emphasize choices and points where things might have gone differently than they did and end with a conclusion that is very related to the things that you specifically addressed. Remember, you never want to introduce new information in your conclusion. And saying, and that's why America is great today, is new information, because it might not necessarily be related. Instead, think about what it was you proved in this paper, and key your conclusion directly to that. Yeah, so, uh, this, <laughs> I, I don't expound on it. Somebody is 
somebody's gonna write a paper like a year from now. COVID happened and that's why we're post grade today. One probably like in two thousand late two thousand something I really put on YouTube I was projecting I predicted that it was gonna experience a one one two epidemic that year in two thousand eighteen. And then it happened that in two thousand twenty they were panicking Panicking over that illness, you know, the illness that was originated in November 2019. So we're off by one year. Often when you think about the beginning of. And also, yeah, like some of this pain, that's why I'm not close to grade today when it comes to COVID. Um, the, re the reality, you know, to, um, when, when somebody would spin something. Changes, not being inevitable, but they were going, it was just going that way. Like, it was like literally things changing, things being extrapolated out. <laughs> you know, it's messed up. American history begins 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, or maybe 1492 when Columbus arrived in the Americas. But the history of America really begins about 15,000 years ago. When people first arrived in the Americas. In this video, I want to provide a very brief overview of native societies before contact to give you an idea of just how diverse and complex these societies were as native groups adapted to and interacted with their environments. Now, there's recently been a scholarly debate about how people first arrived. We know that maybe 12,000 years ago during an ice age, the sea level was lower, and so a spit of land in between the Americas and Asia was exposed over which people may have traveled. But recent archaeological evidence suggests that people were perhaps already in the Americas at the time of this ice age, so it's possible that they may have come earlier in boats. Now, however it was that they arrived, they spread north and south and east throughout the Americas, so that by the time that Europeans arrived in the late 1400s, there were perhaps 50 million people. That's kind of a, a mid-range number for the estimates that historians have made living in the Americas. And of those, four to six million were living in North America. So how did these societies develop? Well, a really big moment was around 5000 BCE when people in Mexico domesticated corn. Maize, as it's also known. And domesticating maize meant that people who had originally been hunters, gatherers, following herds of animals, could partake in settled agriculture. They could develop villages, complex societies. This isn't to say that they stopped hunting and gathering, but they began staying in one place. So let's zoom in a little bit and take a look at some of the major societies in these regions. Native American societies developed around their natural environments using the resources that were available to them. For example, the Southwest Plains and Great Basin, quite dry, a lot of desert. And so societies in these regions adapted to the dry climate in several ways. For example, Native American groups that lived on the Great Plains continued their hunting and gathering way of life, hunting bison, and following the herds of animals in teepees. These were dwellings that were easy to set up and then take down. People in the Southwest, like the ancestral Puebloan people, dealt with this dry environment by creating very complex irrigation projects so that they could water their maize crops using what little moisture there was. The Puebloans lived in large cave complexes as agriculture allowed them to grow their own. In the Northwest, fishing. In the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> Native Americans, a plentiful source of food while farming, allowed the Mississippian peoples to develop large settlements like Cahokia near modern-day St. Louis which at its peak may have had as many as 25 to 40,000 residents. The Mississippians yeah. and other East Coast native peoples relied a lot on what's known as three sister farming, in which people would plant corn, beans, and squash together, which was mutually beneficial to all three plants, as the corn served as a trellis for the beans, and the squash protected the root systems of the corn. All three together create a very nutritious diet, which allowed for a relatively high population density on the East Coast. So by the time that Europeans began to arrive in the late 1400s and 1500s, native societies had been evolving for over 14,000 years. The introduction of European people, pathogens, plants, and animals would introduce an unprecedented amount of change in the Americas. Native American, Native American culture of the West. Native American peoples throughout the Western South Africa, proximity, proximity and abundance of natural resources. Many different groups of Native Americans with distinct cultures based on the roots of the Indian region on the and inhabited the Western region of North America. Hunting, gathering, production, supply, transportation, agriculture, and commercial trade were the staple social forms of Native American cultural practices. Although hunting and gathering proved to be challenging means of livelihood, most of the West had already adapted to the Established in different geographic settlements that were within their borders. The western part of the continent of the United States extended from the top of the Cordillera of Washington through California, Peru, 
So it has this map of all these tribes, Athabascan, Kushan, Mountain, Tuman, Atavasekan, people of the Mountain. The most common food practice is hunting, gathering, and fishing. The most Western indigenous people hunted, fished, hunted, and gathered for sustenance. Of many all over, Native Americans gathered a wide variety of wild food and planted some tobacco. Californian diet. Women would gather across the state plant bringing toxins from the fall so that not immediately flower, creating a less perishable social environment. Specific localized people worship pine nuts, wild plants, and more. Here's a picture of uh, an old lady. It looks like this is daughter. This is a grandmother. This is a woman. Um, they're barefoot. Uh, one lady has a dress. Uh, they both have dresses. She has a coat on over a dress. They have baskets. And they have what look like to be pine knots over there. Um, it's a blanket. I can't tell. Looks like it's cloth, but it's also leather. The baskets are made of reeds. They have a various stitching patterns. They're uh, in front of this wooden wall looks like the wall of these cabins. This is kind of looks, uh, it's almost black and white, but there's a little bit of brownish. It's a, it's a picture of uh, 1920. American bison also roam the Pacific Northwest, providing an easy prey for hunters. Along with cooks in modern dairy, California natives hunted small mammals, snakes, and lizards, and great fish. Decent fishing sustained the native people. Summers, part of California's India, Colorado rivers, native fishermen would use large hatchets to stab the fish swimming through the rushing water. Along with tomahawk shot, fish such as Tiger and Mesa, disgusting with a mudslide for their food, and would completely disrupt the salmon patterns. The Great Basin nat natives were the first create canoes to aid the fishing process and to create a surplus of fish to accommodate the ongoing scarcity. I would not suggest that the Western American Indians had an extremely healthy, nourishing, and nutrient rich diet, much more so than those in the Columbia Northwest who relied on farming. And there's this picture of a Native American spear fishing. Looks like Actually, it looks like it's a guy. He has on a long leather, I forget what they call it. It looks like a skirt, but it's a, basically like a loincloth. He's standing on a rock. He's standing on a rock barefoot. And this guy probably walks around these rocks barefoot. He's just adapted to that, where he's got not many calluses on his feet. He's a very dark skin by the picture. He's got this uh, spear, like this 10 foot spear with a tip that's in the water. There's some trees and mountains in the background. Yeah, so it's a Hoopa man. He hunts for salmon, spear and spear, and makes his money. Societal organization distinct. He has one or two communities. Salmon dominated trade in Mexico as well. As diets in the West, the Dallas area, the stream of the Long Arrows and the Columbia River has been a central point for trade and access, sending people out to the Pacific. 
Listen, listen. The Kumas people in the region near modern day stuff up our way. Around to our trade routes. They were exchanging marine mammals for shucks and specifically domestic animals. And funny thing is, those were often used as food too. Many Western indigenous people, including the Akja family, used a telephone and a local contact lens and were easy to make Yokios made of wood, leaves, and bush. Others have researched areas in the Pacific Northwest where they're more prevalent than it is. The structure of the shelter is often designed, indicated by the library of foods and animal plants and location of the Native Society. More likely than indigenous people were considered the owners of the society and their staff. It's a picture of a traditional Mikio from 1983. Social and religious norms. Resources dictated by the people. The great concentration of resources was also created, originally stressed by class structures and class laws. Much is organized by the class social system in which men would hunt and fish and Chukin, the Chinookin people, a strategic position along the Columbia River, shared fishing and hunting success, practiced slavery to complete a laborious task to process large animals of rice and wheat. And there's a picture of a woman harvesting bison meat and preserving the hide. From it was the picture was taken in Kansas in Less densely populated areas, social, socio political organization, tribal relations, and ancillary work. People generally identify as family based bands of tribe lights. Tribe light would include a few hundred thousand, a few hundred to a thousand people that might culture and were hunted, gathered in smaller units of 10 or 12 people. In areas with sparse natural resources, groups were then more nomadic and less unlikely to work. Even monotonous tasks like hunting, gathering, and spiritual signature of the Western American Indian. Some groups were very quick to get good hunting luck, and others developed rich rhythms of clan such as processing. In the Great Basin, Zapatan speaking people were close family bonds that could to Colombia in order to reunite, to rejuvenate and supply additional bonds. Everything out of the proximity. To natural resources, the term social position is lost. What do you think ha would happen to social structures? The social structure of a large village near a river is not the only social structure created or efficient for natural disasters. Other groups of lifestyle and financial social organization did. When did hunters and gatherers become nomadic? When did they stamp the collector's line? Okay, so. The more resources you had, the more you stayed in place. And if if a village was a large village was depleted, they break up, disband, and started hunting. So their social organization would become a smaller tribe needing more limited resources, and their lifestyle would become more nomadic. So when when did they become did they uh, live nomadic? Yeah, so American bison roam the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, so it, it looks like in the Pacific Northwest, mainly people are gathering on plants and nuts. When? Now, Looks, I'm not sure the specific time it's quoted in this, uh, but in context to the other, yeah, so the Western American Indians were eating better in the plains of the Northwest and relied on 
army. So the fact that they uh the fact that they could farm uh the fact that they couldn't farm one way they limited the population and they were eating more nutrient dust styles. I mainly higher intensity. When did they establish the word nomadic? Um so it's like when did the nomadic Yeah, so many uh, Akshaman people in these lithiums. Uh, mainly they lived in these mountains in the Kami Kami. So, in the Kami Swar, it says, this intertribal, intertribal or intertribal war with Kami have disrupted all the Kami defenses, prevented the war conflicts, and therefore wars between Kami's often and territorial resources. The result is a potent of Chief and decimating tribes supply the war. This conflict between members of the same tribe can possibly fight or at the wise men to stop the southern war. How many types of Native American languages could Native Americans speak? We never track all the different languages that are Native American. And this is linked to the uh so there's hundreds of different there's hundreds of different Native American languages. Yeah, so. No class of white Central America. And that was linked to get outside of the scope of time. More common American names. Most American. Most Indian names are something like the one in South Dakota or Midwest. So. <laughs> Overall, the common names of the Valley and our world was in our own language. Uh, of course, there's only three other nations in America. How many tribes were there? There were so many tribes that stood in the way of war that there were more than 100 nations. Yeah, it was interesting how they. They had details on the north, the northeast Indians, where they were literally less than 400 tribes at their peak. Was it at their peak? I heard they talked about 15,000. Yeah, there's a million people. <laughs> I think at maximum, there was about 50 million people in America, 15 million people in North America, and the vast majority of them were in Mexico. So it's like if there's five million people in America, you're sitting like you're you're devoting a unit of history. Yeah, I, I understand that it's a way of fight. <laughs> it's it's kind of like now that there's seven. I mean, also it matters because it's like there's less people. So it's like now that there's seven billion people, we're not going to devote <laughs> devote a whole lesson to forty thousand people <laughs> who live in forty thousand. Like in the future, are they gonna be like the history of this time span? Like Native American history and kids, Native American culture, culture in the Southwest over the United States, Native Americans in this populated Southwest region are more than likely starting in about 7,000 BC. And it's just with pueblos that aren't as thousand or more than 500 tribes began farming in the region as early as 2000 BC, resulting in abundant crops. Now the host of Apaches are merely hunted and gathered in the area. These groups deserted the area in 1300 C. 1300 CD, probably due to crop failures. European colonists only people partially descended from our ancestral pueblos and Indians. Geographically comparison, Pueblo de Zoc. The southwest region is mainly through present day Arizona and New Mexico, and then through Colorado, Texas. In Mexico, Fort Valley, and indigenous groups that multiplied in this area through colonization. In this region, there were several groups who grew up in the ruins called the Pueblo. The Spanish gave them this name, which means town or village, because they lived in towns or villages of burned in stone like buildings or factories. The three main groups of Pueblo people were the Mogolan, Pocotan, 
Organization. 